Please open the scriptures to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll read the whole chapter together. Verse 1, chapter 5. It is actually reported you, sorry, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. You've become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that is, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little, little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Verse 9, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, or with the covetous and swindlers, or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. For what, I have, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside? God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Wow. That's a heavy chapter. It's been a heavy week for me as I've been preparing this difficult section of Scripture. But I guess that's one of the advantages, or I believe it is, of endeavouring to expositionally preach through a book where you have to take all the hard parts with the not-so-hard parts. And so here we are, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You know, we live in a day where tolerance is the magic that will supposedly solve many of the world's cultural and societal problems. People are expected to be tolerant toward each other no matter what. And if anyone opposes, if anyone opposes the accepted flow of, of culture's actions, that person or what they say is soon tagged as intolerant or even bigoted hate speech. We hear this kind of thing often in our day, be it speaking out against sexual immorality or even sharing your biblical views on the Middle East crisis. Or even taking your stand and making it known on things like biblical marriage, the roles of a husband and wife within the family and the roles of children, etc. But as you well know and may have experienced, often the most intolerant are those who champion tolerance as the key to success. These folks believe in tolerance only when others are in agreement and are conducting themselves in a way that they have established as right. You move outside or oppose their right ways and they will soon show you what intolerance really looks like. So with this well-known theme of being tolerant in mind, how do you think... Paul's instruction 
as we have read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, would go down in today's culture. Can I suggest without a doubt, any who would hold to Paul's instruction as we have read here this morning will be met with extreme intolerance from both inside and outside the church. Names would then flow of you being bigoted, narrow-minded, judgmental extremists, and even more explicit descriptions. But what's even worse, what's even worse, many professing Christians and churches will also side with culture's view on how out of touch with our today's world this ancient chapter really is. And once again, then pet names from these Christian friends would also flow with descriptions like judgmental, legalistic, unloving, and so on. My dear people, the words here in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians are the inspired word of God and are timeless in their relevancy for any true assembly of God's people. So let us read and uh, keep our Bibles open and our finger on the page sort of thing and, and listen and let us learn on how and why God calls his people to treat sin in the camp seriously. Okay? My first heading is, why is church discipline needed? And I believe we see this answered in verses 1 to the beginning of verse 2 of our section. You see, the city of Corinth, I haven't reiterated much about the historical setting of this city. I purposely missed it out, knowing that it would come up and needed to come up in this chapter. The city of Corinth, the culture of Corinth, was well known for its evil and its sexual immorality, like you wouldn't believe. As a matter of fact, a common expression was coined in that day in the then known world to Corinthianize. Okay, And that word Corinthianize simply meant to act and behave like the -the run-of-the-mill Corinthian. And to Corinthianize would be one who was represented with drunken debauchery and gross immorality of every description that you could imagine. That was what it meant to Corinthianize. And the amazing thing is, by God's grace, some of these believers were exactly like that. As we read in chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, because the Apostle Paul lists a whole lot of debauchery there. And he says, and such were some of you. But now you're being saved. And even Corinth, the ancient city of Corinth's pagan religious system. This is just a little picture to put in your back of your minds. Had a temple... To the name of Aphrodite, the supposed goddess of love. And this temple supposedly had a thousand temple prostitutes, I believe both men and women, who would then ply their trade in the city of Corinth below on a nightly basis. This was the city the Corinthians believers lived in. And this was the city, this was the culture that the church was called to live a sanctified life, a set-apart life for Jesus Christ. But as we see, as we see, I'm not making excuses for these guys, but just to give you a little idea, okay? As we see, and the same sadly happens today, and you've heard me say this before, and it's an expression that not was, was not originally coined by me, the sins of the culture can soon become the sins of the church. For what does it say here? It is actually reported among you that there is immorality among you. And immorality is of such as a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead. Let's stop there. First of all, we need to note that the focus of this section I've just read and the whole chapter actually is not on the sinning brother that we'd love to point a finger at. It's not on him. 
You got that? But rather the focus on on here is on the church and its response or lack of response to the sin in their camp. As we see, the Corinthians' problem was that sin in their assembly, it was not a matter of concern for them. It was not, according to them, an issue that needed their attention. This was because they had apparently rationalized or minimized it to a point where it was carry on with business as usual. That was their kind of thinking. With this very thing going on under their noses. Also, we need to note that it was not as if the sin in the camp was something that was only known to a very, very select few. It wasn't scarcely known. For Paul says, it is actually reported that there is a morality among you. This speaks of a common knowledge. Which should have produced what? It should have produced shock and grief like the Apostle Paul was experiencing. So under the direction of the Holy Spirit, Paul steps in to show them that this sin was super serious and it demanded their obedience of a non-tolerant approach. The sin itself was immorality among you. Where a man in the church was having an intimate relationship with his father's wife or perhaps his stepmother. It was, by the way, a form of incest. According to Old Testament law, you can look this up in Leviticus 18, that was forbidden. That's what it was called. It was incest. Now, we don't know whether the man's father was still living or died. It's not told here. And also we don't know that... Because the woman is herself is not addressed here in Paul's letter, it is possible that she was not a part of the church, therefore an unbeliever, and so therefore not coming under the jurisdiction of the church. These are some of the details we need to keep in mind here. But whatever the case, whatever the case, so heinous and wrong was this sin, Paul says, even the Gentiles, even the unsaved around you do not tolerate such sin. How bad is that? As I was thinking about that, so I guess it's a little bit like pedophilia in our culture today. It's not accepted, is it? It's against the law, and generally speaking, it would not be tolerated by even our culture. Of course, this meant that the testimony of the church was being severely hindered. Absolutely, it was being severely hindered. But more shocking than the sin itself to Paul was that the church was tolerating it. So not only was the sin going on, not only was the testimony being hindered, but the church was tolerating it. You know, Paul was infuriated by this response of the church. Paul said that they were what? He said that they were proud. They were arrogant. Because even this wicked Immoral sin, it seems, was not shocking enough to break through their pride and arrogance. And so in this pride, and you know the history, right? Right from chapter 1. This is one of the accusations. This is one of the problems that the Corinthians had. They were prideful people. Of their own intellect, of their own wisdom. Who was the best and who wasn't kind of thing. And pride just doesn't focus in on one little area of life, folks. It permeates the whole lot, right? And even in this area of sin in the camp, they were prideful. And so in their pride and arrogance, rather than acknowledge the existence of this evil amongst them and in their camp, it seems, as I said before, they chose to rationalize it and they chose to excuse it. It is very likely that they were were proud and of their open-mindedness toward the sin. It may be that they were proud of the fact that they were not being judgmental toward anyone. Or, or maybe even looked upon this sinful act as Christian liberty. You can always hear them saying, after all, who am I to judge? A common one, right? 
Well, whatever the case, their prideful arrogance blinded them, folks. It blinded them from seeing the truth of God's standards. It did. So Paul rebuked the church for their foolish pride that rather than ignoring the sin in the camp, they should instead be in a state of mourning because of it. My dear people, any church that does not mourn over sin, and there's heaps of it, but especially sin in its own fellowship, is a church on the brink of spiritual disaster. Remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. See, when it comes to sin, folks, whether we're a believer or whether we're not a believer, it must start with an acknowledgement of our sinfulness before a holy and a righteous God, of our spiritual bankruptcy, and we mourn because of it. Woe is me. I'm a man under. And from the ashes, from the depths of that, is an attitude where God and grace can bless. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It is true that when we cease to be shocked, when we cease to be shocked by sin, we lose a strong resistance against it. If believers become indifferent and complacent to the wickedness of sin, they will soon become like these Corinthians were and proudly follow their own feelings rather than the standards set down in the Word of God. And dear folks, today our culture is a feeling-following culture. If it feels right, do it, is the philosophy of our today's world. And sad to say, So much of that philosophy is making inroads to the church. Because then, it's only then, when we get to that state, when we rely on our feelings, etc., above the word of God, uh, or maybe because we're completely ignorant of the word of God, and this is why we must be in the word of God, to know the will of God. I was writing to a young lady this week, um, not known to many of us here, who says she's a Christian and says she loves the Lord Jesus and, uh, and, uh, and wants to know the will of God and she's living with a boyfriend. I talk to the first Thessalonians. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. Flee immorality. There need to be a mourning. Otherwise, what happens is we will rationalize and ignore even flagrant sins of all description. Folks, the Corinthians needed to see, and as we also need to see, that whenever sin is not mourned over until repented of and cleansed, it will only increase and spread its infection. That's all it will be. And so as there was a need for discipline, we come to our second point, we see that there was a method of church discipline, and we see this um, from the end of... Verse 2 right through to the end of verse 5. And I guess if you want a basic method of church discipline, we cannot go past what is recorded in Matthew 18. And you'll know this well. Allow me to read it again just to refresh your memory. If, you, if your brother sins, Jesus said in Matthew 18, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. Wow, if only more of that was done. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to them, even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, put out, excommunicated from the church. No brain of that process, right? Pretty clear, pretty plain. But we just love missing out all the first parts and get concerned and worried, and then it's harder to do the last part. But in our text today, Paul sees that this is a situation where there has been no confronting by the church in Corinth. There's been no confronting, there's been no initial. 
reproving. There's no telling it to the church. Because the saints were proud and arrogant. And they just wanted to let this whole thing slide. Everyone had, a, had kind of buried their heads in the sand, as it were. And at this stage, the rot had set in and it was making its mark. So Paul moves into the last phase of discipline that we have read in Matthew 18. He moves into the last phase and says, remove the rotten apple from, a, from the box. Excommunicate the offending brother from your fellowship. Because even though not being with you, I have clearly, Paul says, I have clearly summed up the whole situation and passed to my apostolic judgment on the matter. He wasn't being proud. As though I were with you presently among you, deal with this sin in your camp, he says. Drastic action, right? This is where some might call Paul or those who would follow this teaching as being unloving and judgmental. But discipline is not inconsistent with love, folks. We touched on this last week, remember? It's a lack of discipline that is inconsistent with love. The writer of the Hebrews, you know what he said? He said of the Lord, those whom the Lord loves, he what? He disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. Hebrews 12 verse 6. The Lord disciplines his children. Why? Why? Because he loves them. And learning from the Lord's actions, and we all want to learn from the Lord's actions, right? We will discipline our brothers and sisters in the Lord and need to be disciplined ourselves if we step out of line. Why? Because we truly love the Lord and we truly love one another. Again, pretty simple. It's important to note that There was a method, a process, a a proper way about this disciplinary procedure. It wasn't a vindictive personal thing. We see in verse 6 that what were they to do? They were to what? Come together. Wow. That That says it's not the pastor's decision. It's not even the elder's decision alone. You're to come together. This is what Paul told them to do. And in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see that? The name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. That is, this is what they would do. They were to carry out what the apostle had commanded, knowing that their actions would carry all the authority and the will of Jesus Christ. Some of us on our Wednesday night Bible studies, when Peter, remember when he healed that man? I hope you're all up to that section, some of you are not. He healed that man for 40 years, he'd been lame. And he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the Apostle Paul was acting with all the authority of Christ. And the man was healed of his lameness. Well, we have this expression here. Paul says, you are to come together in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, Paul says, I will be with you in spirit on this special assembly and you must carry out in Jesus' name what he has taught on this matter as as if Jesus were there doing it himself. Because in relation to carrying out this kind of discipline, you know what the Jesus has promised? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, There I will be in the midst of them. Sometimes we get that totally out of context. This is in the context of discipline here. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I'll be in the midst of them. So when discipline was carried out, he said, the Apostle Paul was saying to the Corinthians, you are to do that in the name of Jesus Christ. And so what were they to do? The action that Paul cites here was that they were to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What on earth is that all about? It simply means to thrust the brother out of the care and the nurture and the comfort of the local assembly. This is the idea here. To thrust him out. Tell him he's no longer wanted here. He's not, he is not to be in the fellowship. Why is that? Because this brother had defeated all rights to be a part of the church for whom Christ died and also who 
intends to keep that church pure. Because why? Because the church reflects who? It reflects Jesus Christ, right? And so he is to be thrust out because of his action, sinful action. You know very well, folks, that as children, whether we like it or not, are a reflection of their parents. So it is the Lord's church to be a reflection of himself. So correct discipline is needed to protect the assembly's reflection of Christ. And here in Corinth, it demanded one to be excommunicated, to be, to be left to himself, to be left in Satan's domain, to be put out so that he might know and suffer the destruction of the flesh. Now, how is that going to be? How is the destruction of the flesh? What is that all about? Well, this could come about in two ways, I believe. We read a verse today. I think I was just flicked to it. I was reminded of um, when uh, Steve read that it, it, in our communion time in uh, Galatians. It, it just reminded me of it. Galatians 5. And it says... Now those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see that? Well, just hang on to that verse and just as we go through this uh, destruction of the flesh, it'll only come about, it can come about through repentant and self-discipline. In other words, when we as individuals we, we fall into sin or we, we, we choose to sin, or I don't like that falling in, we don't fall. This is as if something happened that was out of our control because as believers when we sin, we choose to sin, folks. We choose, we choose to rebel against the Spirit of God and we grieve the Spirit of God which dwells within us and we choose to sin and, um, and it's upon conviction of the Holy Spirit that we will turn away from that sin, we'll mourn because of it and we'll, we'll confess our sin to the Lord 1, uh, 1 John uh, 1 9, and, and, and we'll repent of our sin and fellowship will be restored. In other words, the lust of the flesh, the wrongness has been dealt with. So it's put to death. It can come around that way. That's the ideal way, right? And we, I believe we need to do that daily. Because if we don't, you know, sin what it is, it just builds up. <laughs> or it can be left to the hands of Satan himself. Where he will buffet us. He did that to Job, remember? Even though it was a different kind of deal, it wasn't because of his sin. But Satan has that ability to buffet us big time. The destruction of the flesh indicates that this brother would, upon repentance, put to death the lust of the flesh or else, or this, or physically die before he normally would have because of his unrepentant sinfulness. Now, that's a reality. In other words, the Lord can take such a brother out. I believe we have biblical evidence of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. After Paul, after, um, Paul tells them and uh, uh, talks about the Lord's Supper that we've just had this morning, and then he, he goes on to, to tell them that some are sick and weak and even sleep among you. In other words, because of their unrepentant sinfulness, the Lord took them out. Happens before they normally would have. If the assembly won't do the job, the Lord can step in in order to protect the reflection of Himself in the assembly and take such people out. It happens. This discipline is not desi is designed to motivate repentance. By the way, that's why we have the word salvation of the Spirit there. But in order for that to be achieved, there must, must first be, by whatever means, the destruction of the flesh. By either repentance, mourning and repentance, and, and, and coming back into the fellowship. And I'm not just talking about the big major sins. Even those little individual sins. That's why we need to come to this table with clean hands and a pure heart. Or whenever we come together. We need to be marked by a people as of repentant people, right? 
And so discipline is designed to motivate repentance. But in order for that to be achieved, as I said, there first must be a destruction of the flesh. And the, and the, Lord, the Lord so loves his church folks that, that he, he will and does dis- discipline erring members. And even if he chooses, he will take out unrepentant believers early. As I said, to protect the witness and the reflection his church gives. So, though every believer's salvation is eternally secure, and we may not, don't get confused with that. Every true born-again believer, salvation is eternally secure. That will not be removed from him. All sin, all our sin needs repenting of, for God has designed procedures of discipline to bring about such repentance. We need to understand and appreciate that God will do what it takes to restore fellowship and to protect the purity of his church because he loves his church. He loves his church. This brings us to point three. And um, we see here the purpose for the church discipline. We see this in verse six to eight. And here we see that Paul gives his purpose for such drastic and decisive action. I won't read that section, but I love, I love the irony that Paul uses here. Remember, these people were proud and arrogant, and, um, and they, they were proud of their wisdom. But Paul comes in here with a very, very simple illustration to deliver truth to these very so-called wise people. And the illustration is all about uh, yeast or, or leaven and a lump of dough. The illustration fitted exactly what was going down here in the church. And we can understand this, right? As yeast or leaven in a lump of dough, it infiltrates and affects the outcome. So does sin permeate and affect the whole assembly. That's the illustration. It's a bit like if you owned a company. Imagine if you owned a company where one of, the, of your employees was always late, often knocked off early, and knowingly lied on his timesheets. And you as the manager or the owner of the company never took any action, never confronted this slacker. The question I want to ask you, what would this employee's actions, what would this, this man's actions and your lack of action, what would that do to your company through the rest of the observant staff. What would it do? Here's what it would do. Your company would be destroyed eventually from within. How is that? By the rest of the staff who would then arrive late, often knock off early, and lie on their timesheets. Folks, Sin like leaven in dough, it spreads and affects the whole. Just like a rotten apple in a box will send the others rotten as well. When blatant sin is tolerated in the church, the foundation of the church is under attack. And if the sin is not addressed, the foundation will implode. So what's the answer to that? God gives us in this text here. Get rid of the old leaven. Or we might say, get rid of the old self in our lives. Or in this case, deal with this unrepentant sin of immorality that endangers the whole assembly. And the reason that Paul gives here for the church's discipline is because Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and of evil, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and in truth. We need to listen up on this. Old leaven, the old ways, the old sinful self. As we have already read this morning before we took this feast here, celebrated in the supper here. Christ nailed that, folks. He nailed it to his cross. The old Jeff Honick has died and has been buried. Has been nailed to the cross of Christ. That's what our baptism symbolizes, right? And when we come up out of the waters, the new Jephonic or the new you, the new believer, is there represented. Yes, the problem is we still have the hankerings of the flesh. That's what we must destroy and put in the place of death daily. With self-discipline. Because if we don't do it in self-discipline, and that's just 
That can happen hundreds of ways. One of the best ways is when we meet together. Bible studies and prayers and, and, and read our Bibles individually in the mornings and, and, and praying. All those things are self-discipline. So how dare we cling and pander to any of that old stuff because our Lord Jesus Christ nailed it to his cross. The old leaven, the old self, the flesh, if not put to death daily, will it'll infect us and then infect the body of Christ's his church. Sin has no place in God's presence, folks. It has no place at this celebration. May we as a church know and practice the ongoing need of coming before God's throne of grace, of meeting our Passover lamb at the foot of his cross, of celebrating a sacrifice like we've done this morning, but never, never, never with old leaven, only with cleansed and pure hearts in sincerity and truth. Finally, we see the boundaries of church discipline. We see this in verses 9 to 13. It's evidently in a prior letter that we have not got in the inspired text or part of the canon. Um, whoop, I forgot, must have forgot a couple there. We come to the boundaries of church discipline. We see this in verses 9 to 13. And in this prior letter, Paul had informed them about their interaction, okay, about their interaction with immoral believers. And, uh, and in their wisdom, the Corinthians, they'd got it all wrong. Or they'd become confused. Or maybe they refused to heed the Apostle Paul's uh, instruction. And so here he reiterates what their interaction with immoral people are to be. And so what he does, he clarifies that immoral unbelievers are in the world. That's just a given. And... Um, and these people are those whom we work with, we rub shoulders with every day, uh, we em maybe employ such people, we work under such people, and we've had no escape from rubbing shoulders and interacting with them. Right? The only other way you can not interact with them like this is Lord, for, for the Lord to come or for you to die. And so Paul says, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. That's just a given. You've got, to, you've got to be out there. And by the way, that's a fantastic place to witness something of Jesus Christ too, right? But then he says, a so-called brother, if he is an immoral person, that is a very different story. This is the person, a professing believer, who blatantly and unrepentantly practices such sins as we see here. There's quite a list of them, by the way, in verse 11. And it's not only just to do with immorality, it's to do with other things. So Paul sort of takes the time to put a bit of an extension on this. In other words, here it is, and the interpretation must be taken literally if we want to be faithful to the text. This is what we must do. This is the boundaries. And the believer will not listen to the counsel of one, and then two or three, and then the whole church. If he still remains unrepentant, he is to be put out of the fellowship. This means that they are to have no participation in worship, in ministry, and definitely not in leadership, and not even any participation in the serving roles in the local church. That's the boundaries. That's what it means. It also means both corporately and individually, believers are not to associate. You see that? They're not to associate. That is, we are to withdraw from them in any kind of social setting that would imply acceptance. This is where it gets really tough, folks. Really tough. This is tough love. But we want to be honest with the text, right? We don't want to dilly-dally around it. Because after all, as I was thinking about this, folks, hey, and I've gone soft on this. And I've been rebuked by the Lord through his text as we read here this morning. After all, I was thinking, how many professing believers, I'm talking about professing believers, those who say, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I believe the same things that you do. After all, we can only look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart, right? So when a person is a professing Christian, that's how we've got to accept it. How many professing believers living in known sin have been made feel comfortable and accepted when fellow Christians treat them as if nothing is wrong? How many? Too many, I would suggest. The reasoning is, oh, 
No, let's not say nothing. Uh, let's treat them with love and compassion. Oh, let's invite them so that they won't feel rejected by us. And I could go on and on here with cliches that would describe what we do. But the text is very clear. We must not even eat with such a one. Wow. Can I suggest, including myself, as I said before, we have gone soft on this. It sounds tough here. It really is. It sounds unloving. But, it's, but as I said, this is tough love that God requires of us in his church. Why? Because it's about loving what God loves, his church whom he redeemed by the precious blood of his son. The lamb of his providing. That's what it's about. It's about loving what he loves. It's also about loving other people like God loves them. We want to love one another like God loves us, don't we? It's not about beating up on people when they first step out of line. or, or It's not about kicking people out who do not measure up to the standards. No way, it's not about that. After all, folks, none of us are perfect. You want to look at someone imperfect, you look at me. I'll confess that. We're imperfect. This text is not saying that the church must be perfect. That's impossible. After all, the church in many ways is... I was saying this to someone last week. The church in many ways is like a hospital. It's for those of us who who know our shortcomings, who know our, our often failings. And who, who admit that we have numerous struggles with temptation and fleshly desires. We have that, right? These people, by the way, these kind of people, are those believers who, who love the Lord, even though they have weaknesses and failings and are imperfect. But these people love the Lord, and, and within them there is this, this longing want to follow and serve Him and become more like God wants Him to be. These are those who who recognize their sin and and they hunger after God's righteousness despite our imperfections. Folks, it's not these people who have been put out of the assembly. Not those people. It's only those who refuse to acknowledge their sin and unrepentantly and persistently continue in their sin even after being warned and counseled against it. You get the picture? These are those who who are to know God's disciplining hands through the church. Why? So that they themselves might repent and return. That's the goal. That's the goal. By the way, we must never stop loving these people. We must never stop praying for them. That they might repent and return to a life of purity and sincerity and truth. And when that happens, when that happens... We need to gladly forgive and comfort them and gladly receive them back into the fellowship. And I believe this brother is the one that Paul had in mind if we go further into 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, where Paul had to remind the church, who did follow his instructions, by the way, on this regard, and, and Paul says, hey, hey, hang on a minute. You, don't be so harsh that, that you leave him out there, a repentant brother. Otherwise, he'll become discouraged in a way. And so we too, when they repent and return, we must receive them gladly back into the fellowship of the Lord's people. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up right now. And, um, and I'll just do it by just laying out three principles just to cement some of these truths that I've, I've, I've had here this morning. And um, principles to apply. The church discipline should only be used for things that clearly contradict the plain teaching of Scripture. You got that? Secondly, church discipline is always a last resort as most matters should be dealt with privately. Always have that in mind. Church discipline is only for when a person refuses to confess and repent. May out of love for the Lord and his church, we as a small group of people see the seriousness of sin in the camp. It is serious, right? And then respond according to God's commands. That's all he asks. Just have a couple of small moments of silent reflection. Maybe ones of repentance for you. Putting things right.
thinking about what's been said before I close with the benediction. Close with the benediction from 2 Thessalonians 5.23. It says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.